Okay, so uh, I'm Sumin Rajadari, so I'm from TCS Research. So this talk is about, uh, uh, you know, introducing about a structured English language for compliance. So I'm slightly moving away from grammars and attribute grammars and start talking about compliance here. So uh, a bit of background and motivation, you know, what it's all about. Uh, so the current uh, financial industry is, you know, uh, has to deal with, you know, uh, uh, compliance and non-compliance kind of problems. And the cost of compliance is quite huge, you know, in this world. Uh, and if you look into the current state of practice, uh, you have uh, systems like, you know, GRC kind of frameworks, which are called, you know, government, governance, risk and compliance frameworks. And uh, what they typically use is a tagging kind of a mechanism. And what I mean by tagging is like, you know, on the left hand side, you can see, you know, regulatory rules which are basically present uh, in like in a form of textual documents. You know, every country has some kind of regulatory rules that is placed. You know, for example, probably everyone has, you know, every bank has like, you know, KYC or know your customer kind of regulations. And these uh, regulations are present in, you know, plain text or natural language text. And what these GRC frameworks typically does is, you know, your enterprise systems, uh, has data, right? So it has a variety of data, maybe, you know, multiple physical databases. So what you do is like, you know, you do some kind of tagging. You try to figure out what are the important rules that you need to check for compliance and, you know, what are the important concepts among these rules. And then you go and manually tag, you know, basically you find out, you know, what are the, maybe the database schema, you know, from the schema, you know, what tables, what fields, and you go and manually tag these fields. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you come up with a report, basically checking for those values, whether they are compliant or not. So that's what the current state of practice that is there in the industry. Uh, so we thought, you know, this is kind of incomplete and inaccurate. You know, it doesn't, and it's kind of a mental model that the domain expert, uh, you know, deals with. So can, can we do something better than that? So I'm just going to talk about, you know, this work started around, you know, one and a half years back. So I'm going to motivate you, you know, how we came across to this domain specific language and what was the next first step that we tried to attack the problem. So we thought that instead of doing some kind of a manual tagging kind of thing, can we come up with some formalism? So, so that we have some, you know, ground foot, you know, solid footing behind, you know, compliance checking. So we uh, looked into that. So we, we, we came up with, uh, looked into the current formal language and which could be ideally applied to the world of compliance. Uh, so we uh, saw that, you know, there are two kinds of logic, like the defeasible logic and deontic logic, uh, which rightly suits into this uh, regulatory world. The reason behind is, you know, regulations has different kind of modalities, uh, like permission, obligation, uh, you know, by which you can accept or deny a concept, uh, as well as, you know, there are different kinds of big forms of modalities that are present. And deontic logic supports that. Also defeasible supports in, in kind of some kind of you know, conflict resolution. Uh, so we uh, used DR Prolog, it's an extension of Prolog, uh, to capture the rules. So we went on manually creating these rules. So we looked into the regulatory text and then went on, you know, manually creating these rules in DR Prolog. And then uh, using that, you know, we had a mechanism by which we can also extract out the data that needs to be checked against the rules. Uh, so, you know, then uh, we run the uh, execution engine and it gives us a report, you know, what is compliant and non-compliant. But then again, you know, uh, anything that is too formal, uh, we found that, you know, if we go to the banks and say, you know, we need to go and write rules in DR Prolog, it's not getting, you know, much acceptance in it. So, uh, uh, so we thought uh, it's not going to really see the end of the, you know, the light of the day. So, you know, can we do something better? Can we raise the level of abstraction from, uh, you know, formal logic to something else? Uh, so the next step, like, you know, can we use models for that? Uh, so we looked into some industry standard and uh, we found that there is a standard called SBVR, which is basically semantics of business vocabulary and rules. Uh, it captures, you know, the, it's an OMG standard, so it's pretty much going to be accepted by the industry. And that's the reason we thought, you know, probably we can, you know, write uh, or create models, you know, in SBVR. And also then come up with a mechanism by which we can translate the SBVR. SBVR is ideally not an execution platform. You cannot execute those SBVR models. So we need to, again, go and reach execution platform. So can we then translate the SBVR rules to DR Prolog? And then the, do the, you know, compliance checking. But again, you know, models, good. You know, one step of abstraction, higher, great. But still not going to, you know, it's still within the uh, limitation of modelers. 
So if you want to involve, you know, the bankers, you know, the domain experts, still it's not going to be, you know, that much acceptable because the modelers need to talk to the bankers. Who knows much about the domain? But the, I'm a modeler, but I don't know much about the domain. So there is an interaction, and uh, so can we do something better? Uh, so we thought, you know, what is best is if we ask the domain experts to write these rules in their own language, that is the best possible scenario. And this guy doesn't know programming and et cetera. So best language would have been English, but yeah, English is too ambiguous. So you cannot have a context programmer for plain English. So we have looked into certain standards and you know, we found that there is a little bit of example from specification language called structure English that ONT itself provides, but they don't have any specific implementation. It's more an example form. So we thought that might be a good premise for us to come up with some kind of a constrained natural language for domain experts that they can write these rules. And then from there, uh, actually, the rest of the things are kind of, you know, automated. Like, you know, you create the SVVR model from SVVR, you go to DR prolog and then do compliance checking. So this is like the history that, you know, how we came uh, to this language. So uh, just to uh, recap, you know, in picture form, you know, what I just now explained. So, yeah, on the left-hand side, you have rules and regulations in plain text or natural language, you know, plain English. And uh, then we started originally, we, you know, manually creating models in SBVR models and then do a, uh, translating that to prolog, uh, DR prolog, and do the compliance checking. And uh, this is what we have currently. So, so we have a, come up with a, an implementation of structured English or, you know, of course, it's a slight variation than what was there in the example of from. Uh, because uh, they, uh, to make it, you know, non-ambiguous uh, uh, also. Uh, so uh, on the, basically the middle box that you see is what the language is, I'll talk about it a little bit in, in the next slides. So it is uh, uh, control natural English, and from there we go to regulatory model and do. On top of that also we found out uh, that, uh, okay, we have come and, you know, allow you, the domain experts, to write rules in structured English, which is, almost close to English, but yeah, with some constraints in it. But, uh, you know, given a regulatory text of 500 pages or 200 pages, and also if I give you a tutorial of this language, uh, maybe the domain experts may not be, you know, that comfortable to go and immediately write, you know, it would be very difficult to even figure out what, from a plain text, you know, what rules are and what non-rules are. So, yeah, so then we tried to use some machine learning and AI techniques on top of this basically to aid the model authoring or you know, the rule authoring that you can do in the editor. So what this does is basically it looks into the uh, regulatory text that is there in uh, uh, natural language. Uh, we use different techniques like Clausy and of course Stanford Purcell, but yeah, on top of that we do something more on top of that uh, to extract out basically the rules from the regulatory text. I know there are a lot of, code, lot of sentences which are actually a bunch of explanations but not rules. So we try to extract out the rules and also provide you suggestions. So when you go and author the rules in our editor, you, the domain experts can actually get suggestions. Almost 50% of the rule is already created for you. And then you go and edit the rules and then can, the rest of the, you know, the part of the tool chain is kind of uh, automated. Uh, so this is almost telling the same story again. Uh, but yeah, just to highlight that, you know, we use Xtext for building the language framework and uh, of course, there is like, you know, context assets and et cetera, et cetera, uh, that, uh, you know, when you author the rules that you can, uh, the domain expert can get support of. Uh, now I will just go and touch the language. So what is uh, the language, you know, has uh, different things uh, like uh, terms. Terms are nothing but concepts, basically. So you, when you start uh, capturing a domain, you know, the first thing that comes to your mind is concepts. So, you know, what concepts are there? And you can also explain on the concepts, like, you know, you can, have synonyms about those concepts. You can have a description of those concepts. The concepts could be also inherited from other concepts. So there could be a hierarchy of concepts that can happen. And, uh, uh, and there could be relationship between two concepts. So verbs are nothing but that can relate one concept to another. Uh, modalities, yeah, that's an important part of the language because it needs to capture different uh, propositions like permission, obligation, prohibition. There are eight different kind of modalities that is supported. Uh, quantification is, you know, simple things like, you know, at most, at least, exactly. Uh, some kind of restrictions, greater than, less than, you know, equals. Uh, conjunctions and disjunctions and also conditionals. So this is good enough, you know, to write rules. That's what we find. You know, rules are nothing but conditional statements. It has basically implication statements and with an antecedent or consequent. So you can, you know, so we found that, of course, the language is growing. We, we're trying to make it even more simpler. That's the key to 
the success of the language, I'd say. Uh, if we try to make it too complex, then it's not going to be usable. So there is a trade-off. So just an example. Uh, so this is the example of the language uh, that you can write the rule in. So it just says rule disposal. It is obligatory that you know it's one of the rules from method regulations, particularly coming up. You know, just describing you know what is a disposal in a trade kind of a transaction. So it says that it is obligatory that trade is disposal if this A, B, C, and conditions. Basically, if trade is a sale of financial instruments, or trade is a derivative contract, or trade is a decrease in notional amount. So that's the simple, and there are you know, certain aspects that you can see, you know, what are disjunction, what are verbs, what are condition. And the next one also shows an uh, example of a quantification that you can see, it just talks about a KYC rule. Uh, you know, it happens that uh, banks need to monitor transactions uh, during, you know, in a month for certain customers, if the transaction value, say for example, exceeds a certain limit. So for example, in India, if you if you are crossing like more than fifty thousand rupees, you know, per month, then that transaction needs to be reported to the regulatory body. For example, RBI. Uh, in Europe also definitely you'll have you know, or in US also you'll have different kind of you know regulations like that. So it just says that uh, the bank takes into account individual cash transactions. If summissions is a debit or credit, you know, you can either do a debit or credit. Or and a submission is greater than you know uh, one lakh, and transaction duration is monthly. So this is uh, the simplicity, you know, as much simple as possible that one can write these rules in. Uh, this is the uh, the editor, as is, as I said, you know, it's based on XX. So many of the things you get in for free. Of course, you need to write many of the parts, but yeah, uh, it gives a jump start, you know, to building the uh, language framework. So it has uh, four different parts. Uh, first part is the vocabulary. Basically, vocabulary is nothing but captures the ontology of the concepts in the domain. So top basically shows the vocabulary. Some minor things have changed out there. You know, the paper was submitted four months back, and we are continuously upgrading the language also. So certain things have changed. I, I cannot, uh, I didn't show it, put it up here. But uh, uh, yeah, so it, it, it captures basically the ontology. Uh, second is facts. Facts are nothing but. Uh, uh, Relationship between uh, uh, binary uh, predicates as well as you know unary like characteristics. Uh, so those are facts, and uh, you expand facts to create rules. Basically, you add quantification, qualification, modality, as well as you put up put up you know conjunction, disjunction in your antecedent and consequent to come up with rules. Basically, so that's the final thing, the rules file. You know, basically the rules is what you finally write. That's what I showed in the previous slide. Uh, so yeah, so vocabulary file, fact file, rules file, and also verbs and thing, but you know that captures uh, uh, concepts, you know, relationship between concepts. So this is a just a quick view of the editor. Uh, this is a couple of examples we wanted to put from Mifid. You know, Mifid is a uh, European regulation for markets in financial instruments and derivatives. So this is taken from Article 26. Uh, from there, you know, just a couple of paragraphs, you know, from there. So it talks about, you know, what is a trade is, and a trade is could be an acquisition or a disposal. And then the top, you basically see the rules that is coming up in plain text or in, you know, natural English, how it is written out there in the regulatory uh, world. So it says that, you know, acquisition referred to paragraph one shall include, basically it tries to define what is an acquisition. Uh, paragraph one should include the following, that is a purchase of a financial instrument, entering into a derivative contract, or an increase in notional amount. I already explained you the example, you know, in the earlier slide, and this is how you write the rule in SC. Similarly, for disposal, and of course, there are a bunch of rules. So, for example, when we are looking into KYC, there are like 187 rules. We are currently looking into MMSR, which is called Money Market Statistical Reporting, another kind of a European EU kind of a, for one of our customers, it has uh, 24 into five, so around 100 rules out there. Uh, so as I said, you know, one of the primary goal of the language to be as simple as possible. If you try to make it that complex, then it's going to be usable. File the domain experts. So this shows like a default behavior uh, when you have uh, conjunction and disjunction of facts. Uh, of, uh, so basically, it says that you know, on the uh, it says you know, bank Texas proof certificate one or certificate two, and certificate two or you know, so basically just conjunction and disjunction facts out there. Uh, what it shows is that you know the default behavior. You don't need to you know put up a parenthesis. You know if you don't put up a parenthesis, how the expression is going to be evaluated? Of course, for uh, certain guys who wants to put up a parenthesis, of course it's going to be 
you know evaluated you know the, the, the right way that an expression is normally evaluated if you have bad decisions. But if you don't have you know what would be the default behavior. So we wanted to give an addition to the guys you know if you don't want to you know develop with bad decisions also. So the default behavior is like we, we, we try to pair up all the conjunctions together and then we disjunct with the disjunctions. So that's how the default mechanism just wanted to highlight you know one of the things that's there in the language. Okay, so the next part is, uh, of course, uh, we, do, we don't stay there, you know. So, so the editor allows you to go and author the rules by the domain expert, but the rest of the tool chain, you know, is kind of oblivious to you. you don't see them. Uh, so, you know, rest of the things are kind of semi-automated, or, or actually it's fully automated. So this shows you, you know, as you go and author the rules on the left-hand side in the editor, uh, this model, which is an SBVR, inst you know, instance of an SBVR meta model. Uh, this gets created in the background. The domain expert doesn't see that. You know, this gets internal to the system. It's like an intermediary language. So this just is created as you go on authoring the rules in the background. And from here, you can go to any target uh, uh, formal specification language. For example, we were also looking into drools uh, as our target language, and we are currently building a system. You know, uh, certain customers could be, you know, Specific that you know they have their homegrown formulas and doesn't want to, so we can do that. So, you know, so sticking to SPVR actually helped us. It's kind of an intermediate language from where it is also accepted by the industry. At the same time, we can go to any target specification, you know, formal specification. So that's the reason we you know we had an intermediate language. It's almost like a CLI or you know like an intermediate language you have in the .NET world. So and from there you can go to any target specification. So SPVR you know acts like that. Okay, so almost to the end. So these are the current set of regulations being investigated or piloted with our customers. Yeah, almost. So, so with our customers, so you know, KYC is there almost with every country. But uh, we are looking into for certain banks in India. We are, you know, so we were looking for KYC kind of regulations. You know, capturing them using our framework. Uh, as I already introduced to you, Mifid too. Uh, uh, it's it's also being looked into. At the same time, Mifid is. Almost like a 500-page document for regulations, and also 500-page documents for derivatives, and it's pretty complicated. You know, the banks were telling us, even they can't even. And you know, one thing that I want to be very clear that we are not in the world of interpretation of the regulations. We leave the interpretation to the you know to the banks itself. We just provide you an aid to write the regulations that you interpret in your own world. Uh, so banks was telling us, you know, it's very difficult for us even to you know interpret these regulations of MIFID because it's still ambiguous, a lot of things are not very clear. So then they said, you know, can you to do a pilot, can you do MMSR, which is basically a money market statistical reporting kind of regulations, and it is running for the last couple of years in Europe. So they said, you know, we have already evidence data for that, and we can evaluate your framework using that. So we said, okay, let's, why not we do that, you know, because there is already data available, and we can actually go and evaluate our framework much better than, uh, you know, trying to do something which is still not interpreted well. And GDPR is another kind of regulations. It's there in Europe, but uh, this is one of our clients in the US, well, United States in automobile assur uh, assurance, therefore the defense industry out there. Uh, so we are looking at GDPR regulations. And one final thing just I just wanted to add, you know, although this talk is about compliance thing, but you know, whatever the line of attack or the approach that you, we have can be applied just not to the world of regulations. But also to the world of you know like a policy, you know, or any kind of document-based processes where there is kind of business rules that you have got, and you need to do some kind of a checking, and uh, you know, so so we are looking into you know international trade finance, and they have like documents like UPC, you know, Universal Customs Code and Practice, and we are trying to you know apply the same technique for that world also. It is not specifically a regulatory world. That's something. Few future work I have not mentioned in the slide, but uh, so this w talk was mostly about checking compliance. But something more for the future, you know, for thoughts is like you know this itself is still not complete. You know, we have a you know little bit of way to go. We need to do the pilots and stuff like that. But future work could be, you know, to you know, make something compliant. You know, just not check compliant and to stay compliant. You know, how we can you know stay compliant. And of course, you know, a lot of the regulations go on changing. So how do you address the you know? You know, the changing world of regulations, those kind of things. Uh, so those are some things that we will, we have in our pipeline. But yeah, so this talk is mostly about you know checking and coming up with a line of attack to handle this thing.
Yeah.